Hello, everybody. Welcome to this race session where our speakers will be sharing tips on how to maximize your fundraising venue with contactless giving. I think we should get started now. Um, so thank you very much for joining us today. I am Rosario Belolio, and I am program coordinator of the Chartered Institute of Fundraising Race Program. So um, today's session is the first on digital fundraising for arts and culture organizations. And we will be exploring the benefits of contactless giving for your organization. Um, and we will start with a presentation by Vicky Hewitt uh, and Emma Rose. So now I would like to hand it over to Vicky. Hello, everyone. Um, Emma and I are really pleased to be here. We always love um, meeting lots of uh, new charities. Um, so I'm the Head of Marketing Communications at Give A Little, and I'm going to do this presentation with Emma, who's our Senior Charity Community Manager. Um, today we'll be talking about uh, getting started with cashless giving and also uh, some tips on optimising your donation revenues. So we all know that the world has changed and that we're living in a predominantly cashless society. Um, and according to the Charity Aid Foundation's UK Giving Report, just 7% of donors were using cash in January 2021, um, and obviously driven by the pandemic. Uh, but in their follow-up report in 2022, they stated that cash giving remains far below its historical norms and that they expect this trend to continue. And they've just recently um, just released another report where, where they're saying the same thing, essentially. Um, so I always think psychology is really interesting um, with, actually, I'm just going to go back a slide because I didn't mention some of the other stats that I have on, on this slide, which I think are really interesting and worth pointing out. Um, so digital wallet payments, for example, are growing. So 44.2% of uh, payments um, in 2020 were digital wallet payments. So that's Apple Pay and Google Pay. And these are forecast to increase to 51.7% uh, by 2024. And we always say what's happening in retail will come to the charity sector. So they're things that, um, that, that we really need to be mindful of in the charity sector and ensure donors have the, uh, the way to pay that they want to, to pay. Um, and the other stat there that 60% um, of uh, people will abandon their shopping cart if they can't pay in the way that they want to. So again, you know, I've I've become a sort of Apple Pay um, obsessive and I'm exactly in that bucket. If I can't pay by Apple Pay, I'm just kind of on to the next thing. Um, so it's also worth noting that um, cashless fundraising gives charities the opportunity to know more about their casual and one off donors whether that's by asking them to opt into marketing contact or make a gift aid collect, uh, declaration on the contactless donation device. Um, the data that charities can gather through cashless fundraising means that they can take those one-off and casual donors on their stewardship journey and try to convert them to regular givers, which is, which is I'm sure, what, what, we're all, um, what you're all looking for. Um, and then the other thing that we always like to highlight at Give A Little is that it's really important to say that the point of sale is a completely different experience to the point of donation. One is a transaction where you're purchasing a good or service, whereas the other involves voluntarily giving your money away without receiving anything in return. And that's why a point of donation requires a completely different approach. Since starting at Give A Little, I have encountered a few charities who are using card readers with apps designed for point of sale um, and therefore providing a, an unsatisfactory experience for the donor. When you use software that's designed with donors in mind, um, with multiple donation values and customizable images or video, it leads to both a higher average donation value um, and trust, which is so important. So who is Give A Little? So we aim to be the most easy to use, flexible and affordable way for charities to access cashless giving. The platform is designed to be an enabler and to integrate with a range of devices, payment processes and technologies. So charities can select what works best for them. So there are currently over 6,000 charities using Give A Little 
with, uh, and uh, we've just hit actually 20 million. So I need to change this slide. Um, 20 million uh, was donated, I think a couple of weeks ago. So that was a new milestone for us. Charities using the platform range from Oxfam and London Zoo to Milton Keynes Museum, the Hunterian Museum, Shakespeare Birthplace Trust, Cancer Research UK, and many, many more. Um, so we always like to say this as well. Um, we're very mission led and it's our mission to reduce the cost barrier for charities moving to cashless. We also want to shield charities from the fast pace of technology change and evolve the platform to adapt to new ways of paying so charities don't have to. Um, payment technologies are just evolving all the time. And we know that charities just don't have the time to keep an eye on this. And they certainly don't have tech teams. Um, so we're really passionate about making sure we're keeping up with that and then bringing the latest technologies to you. Um, there are currently three ways that charities can use Give It At All. Um, on the left hand side, you can see online and QR codes. I'm sure many of you already have a way of uh, collecting online donations, but uh, we always say at Give It A Tool that um, it's really good to uh, create bespoke campaigns and be able to create a very quick campaign that's related, say, to an event or if you're doing a fundraising appeal and then have a dedicated QR code for that. Um, then um, the other two kind of images there show the different ways that you can use Give A Little to collect contactless donations. So we currently work with two um, partners. The one on the left there is a Payaz. It's a large, um, a large device with a 10 inch screen. And then the collecting device there on the right is a, a, can be used portably or fixed, has the sum up card reader in, in the top. Um, and then um, you can also use us in what we call a do-it-yourself um, approach to create your own point of donation. And we like to show this theatre here, the King's Theatre in Portsmouth, who's they've essentially uh, designed a, a Fomex backboard and put some branding on it. Um, and then they've drilled some holes in to um, affix the Android device and the sum up card reader. Um, and I think it looks really professional. Um, we actually challenged ourselves to make one um, because we don't like to say to charities, charities, off you go, make this point of donation if we haven't done it ourselves. Um, so we actually have a video on our website showing how we went about doing that. Um, but there are lots of other examples, you know, uh, you, and they're really aimed at allowing charities to have a very affordable way of uh, dipping their toe in the water with, with cashless giving. Um, and you can mix and match with all these things as well. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, the point of donation experience is completely different to point of sale. And that's why we delivered, we developed Give A Little with the donor in mind. So the platform allows you to create customizable campaigns with tailored messaging, images and video. It provides a frictionless donation experience. So we provide the tech, which is complex and constantly evolving, so charities don't have to. Donors can opt in to gift aid. Um, charities can download data, especially formal, formulated for HMRC claims. Um, donors can opt into marketing communications um, and charities can download um, detailed reports. Um, our admin dashboard is designed to give charities the information that they, they need with lots of uh, details and summary reports. And we're actually working on a UX design project to give more detailed sort of snapshot um, information on campaigns so charities can monitor uh, their campaigns and see what their average donation value is, what their most popular uh, donation uh, value is so that they can test and learn and make changes as they go on. Um, we can we also allow charities to empower volunteers um, with their own logins um, and there's some element of remote device management as well, which is really useful if you're at home and your device is in the museum or the heritage site and you want to change the campaign and um, that's something that's really easy to do. So, as I said before, contactless cashless leads to higher average donation values than what we saw with cash. And currently on Give A Little, um, we see an average contactless uh, donation value of £9.69. So that's your card present, tapping your card on a device. 
um, similar values on QR codes as well, because it's a similar kind of experience where you're out and about and you're maybe making a donation kind of on the hoof. Um, whereas online um, average donations are uh, £38.47. I think that's more because people are, they know they're going to the website to make a donation. So I'm now going to play, before handing over to Emma, I'm now going to play a little video. So I was lucky enough to um, meet the Canon Mark Powell at Windsor Chapel. Um, he invited me for a cup of tea, which was very nice. Um, and I uh, shot this it's a short video, um, two minute video, just uh, so you can hear in, in his words um, how he's using um, Give a Little and then Emma will take over from there. St George's Chapel stands within Windsor Castle, which is a scheduled ancient monument and still a working royal palace. The uh, chapel here is self-funding, so we rely on donations from visitors, uh, collections at services, and money from other benefactors and grant making bodies. We've noticed um, that a lot of people don't carry cash or use cash anymore. So to uh, encourage uh, donations, uh, we were keen to have a contactless paying uh, machine, both for visitors to the chapel and for people coming to our services. We did some research on the best way of taking contactless donations and were recommended to uh, use pay as and give a little. Uh, and we've been very happy with uh, the way the gadgets work. Give a little have given great support, uh, explaining to somebody who's not very good with IT, how to install and get the machines uh, working. Give a little gave us a lot of help with designing the uh, welcome screen, which is a, a slideshow, three different pictures of uh, the chapel. Uh, it's very eye catching and the fact that the image keeps changing draws attention uh, to the machines. We take advantage of the gift aid scheme for our UK tax paying visitors. So um, to be able to do that through these uh, gadgets and get a report that's ready to send to HMRC uh, is, is very useful for us. So if anybody is visiting Windsor Castle and comes into the chapel, uh, we'd encourage you to make a donation to support our work as a chapel and support the upkeep and care of these buildings. Hi everybody, so I'm Emma. Um, I have got a bit of a cold, so apologies for my voice. Um, I think um, Canon Mark Powell summed that up really nicely, but we have got a screen just to kind of reiterate the, the main features and the way that they use the pay as devices in the St George's Chapel. So they have a three slideshow um, template, which we help them design. Um, and that moves, as he said, it's very eye catching. Um, and we suggest a short punchy message. Um, they have separate campaigns with the same, sorry, they use the same campaigns across the chapel and that gives them the ability to analyze which works best in terms of positioning, imagery, wording and donation amounts. So as Vicky mentioned, you have the data in the background we suggest that you definitely look at that and, and kind of change your campaigns accordingly. So that's that one. Makes me laugh how he refers to them as gadgets as well. It always makes me smile when he says that. Um, and then this is a, a collecting that we mentioned earlier. So it's a, a smaller screen, um, but again, just showing you ways to use. So strong eye catching visuals work really nicely. And that gives you the ability to promote and highlight particular appeals that you have or particular exhibits that you have in your museum particular times of year and it's very quick and easy to change those as well by logging into your account. Um, as Vicky mentioned you can also change those remotely so if you have a device that's um, mounted on a wall and you're at home you can easily change the campaign from home without having to go in to um, the office or the, the museum etc. Um, but yeah you can kind of highlight specific uh, campaigns that you have going on at any one time. And the next one, um, this is just to show you as well, we also have the ability to add videos, which is actually technically how we create the slideshow is just static images that we put into an MP4 file. Um, but this is a really lovely example. And I'm sure if you weren't all on mute, we would have heard a resounding, ah, oh, when this picture came up, because we always do when we show it in person. Um, it gives you a nice way to add a feel fun factor, um, 
once someone has given a donation. As Vicky said, it's very different to a re point of retail. They're not receiving something in return. So giving them this lovely thank you at the end is really nice. Um, we just recently started working with the Eden Project and they have a lovely thank you screen, which is um, a boy swinging on a swing. Um, so it just gives kind of, it's in a children's play area. So it's a nice kind of relating to the appeal, but also giving that person a nice experience uh, ending off giving their donation. Uh, next up, we have Guildhall Art Gallery. Um, so much like um, lots of charities that we work with who have museums or memorial halls, um, places like that, they don't charge an entrance fee. So they have some collectings, one at the entrance and one at the exit, which again allows them to analyse what works best, i.e. are people more generous when they arrive or when they leave? Um, so analysing the data. Um, and they have a very clear signage. So we suggest whether you have your DIY method, a collecting or a pay as, that you are very specific, clearly um, telling your supporters and your donors what, what that device will do. Um, you know, you can mount it to a wall, but we suggest you put something around it that very clearly shows it's for donations, giving that person the reassurance and the, um, you know, knowing what they're going to do there rather than kind of looking at it thinking, I'm not sure what it is, so I'm going to avoid it. So as you can see, they've got a sign next to it that says pay what you can. And they also um, use them remotely in terms of giving them to volunteers to ask for donations at the end of a tour. So we've seen that if you have someone with a collector and you're having that personal interaction, you're actually probably going to get more donations than something that's ju just left um, on, a, on a wall or on a plinth. Naturally, if you have that personal interaction and you have more of an ask, um, you're likely to get better return. Uh, we also work with London Zoo, as Vicky mentioned, which is a really lovely example of using, as we mentioned earlier, different campaigns that are um, specific to the area that they're fundraising for. So as you can see, this is the tiger area and they're giving lovely examples of what the donations will actually achieve. Um, so you probably heard the phrase charity shopping lists before, which give the donors um, a logical um, explanation as to what the money they give, how that will help your charity. So by doing that, you're encouraging the donors to maybe give more than they would have, or maybe give something that they wouldn't have at all before. So as you can see, they've got some lovely signage um, telling the donor what the money will achieve, explaining about the animals that they relate to, and it allows them again to do some A-B testing. So to see, for example, if different images work better than others, if different donation amounts work better. Um, again, looking at the data, can't reiterate that enough. Um, so that's the London Zoo example. The other things actually, just to, you don't need to change the sign, um, but with London Zoo, I, it's a really great example to show and talk about coming back to your donors and creating that ongoing journey as well. Obviously this is applicable for all of you, but the, the story of the zoo works quite nicely. So for example, if you were raising money for a new penguin enclosure and you were taking marketing opt-ins at that point as well as the, as the donation, you would be able to know who was interested in that, who had given to that appeal. And then once you've reached your target and you've built that new enclosure or in your situation, you've, you've got a new exhibition or you've got a new renovated part of your building, you can go out to those donors and invite them back in. So thanking them again and saying, you know, thanks to your donation, we have achieved this please come back and visit and see what we've done with that money. So that's a really good example of how you can use your opt-ins and getting to know your supporters in a long-term relationship going forward. So sorry, Vicky, you can go to the next one now. Um, so this is Milton Keynes Museum. So again, they have collect-ins and they have them located in different spaces. So they, as you can see, reception, gallery and cafe. Um, one thing that we always suggest as well is that you really consider where you're putting your devices um, in terms of the location but also the height you know are there going to be children are you a charity that works with disabled people do you need to be low down for um, wheelchair access so consider anything and everything um also if, if you're looking at a cafe for example we would suggest you put it separate to the point of sale so if someone is you know scrambling with their bags and holding a tray of cake and cups of tea that's not the ideal point to put a donation point as well because they're already going to have their hands full so consider where you're putting the devices. So they have the collectins mounted, but they also, although they're mounted to the wall, you can remove them and carry them around portably. So they also use them at their special days, like the Heritage Day. Um, and I think they do like a Victorian 
dress up type um, day as well. So they take them down and they carry them around with volunteers to ask for donations on those, those days as well. Um, Liverpool Cathedral are a really good example um, in terms of looking at the data and making changes from that. So during Eurovision, obviously held in Liverpool this year, they had an art installation from a Ukrainian artist. Um, so they had much more footfall coming into the cathedral to see the art installation. So they added four payas devices in different areas throughout the cathedral. Um, and every day, it was a 10 day period that they were looking at the data, collecting donations. Hopefully you can see it's quite small, but the donation amounts they had to begin with were five, 10, 15 and 20. Very early on, they found that people were actually being a lot more generous than they had anticipated, um, which is something that we always suggest to charities too. So aim high, um, even if you're wanting to give low amounts as well, always give a higher option because people will tend to sometimes maybe go in the middle. Um, so you're kind of psychologically encouraging them to potentially give more than they would have, which I know sounds terrible, but actually we need their donation, so it's fine. Um, but Liverpool Cathedral, um, they found that very, very few people were using the £5 donation amount. So what they did is they got rid of that and they added a £30 donation um, and they received many of those amounts. So by looking at the data during the campaign, they were able to amend it accordingly. So lots of charities will have kind of a review amount at the end. So not a review, review, review amount, a review of the campaign at the end of the campaign. But by looking at the data throughout the campaign, you don't need to wait to the end. You can make your changes throughout um, and, and hopefully get more success that way. You also have a choose your own amount as well. So use that. So if you see, you know, that you have bespoke amounts, but lots of people are giving more as a choose your own, again, up the, the amounts that you're putting in there as the bespoke ones accordingly. Next one, Cancer Research. So obviously everybody's heard of Cancer Research. They're a very lucky charity in terms of their budgets and their staff. And they're a really great example for us because when they first started using Give a Little, um, it was predominantly for face-to-face -face fundraising, but they had such great success that they actually have a team um, for cashless donations who are promoting cashless donations throughout the entire charity. Um, they've had really great success at other um, events such as high value donor events with high net worth individuals where they took an astronomical amount of money in one night. Um, they use it at Race for Life Relay. So they have people walking in the crowds with the portable devices, taking donations from the, um, I can't think of the word, the people that watch, <laughs> spectators. Um, they have used them at gala events where they've needed to separate income streams. So you can create as many campaigns as you want on Give a Little that allows you to see how much has been raised per campaign. Um, you also have the ability to switch gift aid on or off and marketing opt-ins on or off on each of those as well. And you have the ability to create what we refer to as lists of campaigns, which is essentially exactly that. So at their gala dinner, they have three campaigns, one for raffle, one for auction and one for donations, where the member of staff, the volunteer or even the donor themselves can pick the one that they are making their donation to and then follow through with the journey for that relevant one which allows them to know how much was raised for each of those individual streams in one evening so you can have as many campaigns as you want within that list um, we've seen churches use those as well for for example sunday service uh, general donations so lots of different types of campaigns but giving you the ability to separate them out and see how they're performing keep your income separate as well <clears throat> excuse me and then we've got just an example of QR codes and online. Um, so the first one is Paste. They had um, QR codes with local businesses that provided food hampers and they put QR codes on all of their marketing materials. So some charities will have a combination. So they'll have people with the collectins or the pay as devices or the DIY alongside QR codes. So if you think, for example, if you had a gala dinner or something like that, you have your volunteers with the devices, but you can also it, you know, kind of make that a lot more impactful using QR codes on the menus, the printed materials, posters, very, very cost effective because it doesn't cost anything at all. You're not having to spend money on a device or an Android machine, anything at all. And it just gives you the ability to spread that a lot further, which leads to the Jersey Poppy appeal. Um, so they didn't have the ability to have lots of volunteers throughout the island. So they used the QR codes where they couldn't have people. Um, as Vicky showed earlier, the 
the journey is effectively the same in terms of the lovely screen, the campaign screen that they will see, the ability to pick the, the amount or choose their own. And as I said, if you have Stripe, the ability to use Google Pay and Apple Pay, which makes the donation extremely quick and easy to do. Um, so effectively, anywhere you don't have people, QR codes are a really good option. Um, one thing that I always say to charities is if you are using QR codes, make it very clear what they are for. Um, because QR codes are used for many, many things nowadays. I think the debacle of track and trace means that everyone knows how they work now, um, but people can be cautious of them if they're not sure what they're going to do. So just like we recommend with devices, make sure you are marketing them with some signage or some wording around them, just reassuring people, you know, use this QR code to make a donation, use this QR code to whatever it is you're, you're sending them to do. But in this situation, it would be making a donation to give them that reassurance and that confidence and then the benefit of using the give a little app obviously is that you get these beautiful campaigns at the end of the, the journey whether it's on a device or a qr code that has your charity branding your wording your imagery which gives your donors and supporters that confidence that they are in the right place um so yeah so um just taking over uh from emma i just wanted to um highlight uh, that we have a group model, which might be of interest to some people on the call. So we have a, a very uh, long-standing um, relationship with the Church of England. Um, we've stopped been working with them for four years um, and they wanted all of their churches to have access to Give a Little Premium, which allows uh, all of the features that we've been talking about, the customization and the gift aid and marketing opt-in they wanted even the tiniest church to have access to that um, and so they have a national license with us that allows all of their churches to use give a little for free um, the group model doesn't have to work in that way it's just um, if you have members or other organizations within your umbrella organization um, that that essentially have their own bank accounts, then you can kind of link them all to one group account. Um, and then you can, as a group owner, sort of decide if you want your members to have a discount or, or that kind of thing. Um, so it's it's quite, uh, it's it certainly worked really well for the Church of England. And I, or, I always uh, like to say when we're talking to museums or um, heritage sites that I think there's a lot to learn from from the church sector and particularly the Church of England with the way that they've gone about um, rolling out digital giving to their parishes. Um, I'm sure you can imagine that a lot of the people that we're dealing with with the Church of England are maybe of an older generation or that they actually, their main role like Canon Mark Powell is not, <laughs> is not to administer contactless devices, but they end up having to do it because obviously a church, you know, ranging from the smallest ones, they're not gonna have an awful lot of staff members and um, so we've always designed give a little to be really easy and user friendly for people who don't have much much in the way of it experience and so on um, and also there's a lot of similarities i think between museums heritage sites and churches in the sense that they have buildings they have got to consider um, where do I locate my device? Um, do I have good connectivity? Um, how do how do I explain to you know my congregation and my volunteers you know how to use the devices? Um, so yeah, we've we've learned a lot from them, and I feel like it's we always you know when we when we're meeting with museums or heritage sites, we like to pass over those insights that that we've learned. And I think the Church of England have been very ambitious um, in their in their rollout because they know how important it is. They need to. They need to give their both their uh, congregation, their regular congregation, but also their casual visitors. And often many churches are tourist attractions um, in their own right. So there's plenty of opportunities to get um, one off uh, donations. Um, then um, I just wanted to summarize with some um, tips um, based upon what we've um, been talking about uh, over the past uh, 30 minutes or so. So firstly, we would say make the donation experience as engaging as possible um, and think about which audience you are targeting um, as this will help you maximize your donation revenue. So as Emma was saying with the Eden Project example, you know, their campaign is themed or designed to fit in with their uh, uh, nature and their play area and is aimed um, at 
uh, at their programs that are focused around education. Um, and I know th there was one church who they they had a different campaign for their kind of um, uh, parents and baby group to their general donation because um, it just makes donors feel like yes I belong here this is this this is this feels right for me and obviously the the thank you screens um, is an is another opportunity to make the donor feel good about making a donation um, so yeah and and also having those campaigns that are uh, targeted around a specific campaign um, is also really both very useful for tracking income, um, uh, but also, again, um, really resonates with donors. Um, and um, I definitely recommend experimenting with different donation amounts. I think, you know, Emma gave some really good examples, particularly of Liverpool Cathedral, who are really learning, not just not just getting it set up, putting it in a corner and thinking, I've done, I've done cashless, I've done contactless. It's about um, really, really looking at that data, um, definitely adding a higher donation value than you think people will give. Because again, that psychology point, it really does lead to people um, giving more. Um, definitely use QR codes alongside uh, contactless um, you know, put them on printed newsletters or posters. Churches can use them on order of services or carol service sheets. Um, and really think about making the payment process as easy and slick as possible. Um, so uh, as we were saying, you know, making sure donors can pay by Apple Pay or Google Pay. So it's a really smooth experience. Um, again, this is, this is a way to maximize donations. Um, uh, definitely consider enabling those marketing opt-ins or um, gift aid. And we've also got a feature called gift aid later because a lot of charities all, you know, we've got queues of donors. So therefore we don't want to enable gift aid because we don't want the donor filling out the full um, form on the device. Um, gift aid later, simply ask the donor for an email address and then we send them an email and they can then read a bit more about gift aid and fill out the form um, in the comfort of their own home. Um, so, so yeah, I think there's so there's so much that you can do um, with cashless and contactless. We're very passionate about it, and we uh, love meeting with uh, new charities um, and organisations to to really understand that. In the, every charity is different. Everyone has a different. Um, challenge and we love to sort of meet meet with them and sort of really talk through our ideas or advice on on how to make uh, cashless a success um so i'm just going to finish because as i say um we're so passionate about our community of charities we use the word community a lot because we certainly don't see ourselves as a sales led organization we're very mission led we really want to make cashless available to charities of all sizes whether that's through uh, small charities being able to use Give a Little for free and then the larger charities supporting them, enabling that. Um, it's something, again, we're, ve we're very uh, passionate about. And when we um, when we achieved that 20 million milestone, which we it took three years to get to 10 million pounds worth of donations through the platform. And then it only took a further 11 months to get to 20 million, which just shows, you know, not only how much Give a Little has grown, but just, you know, how much, how many more charities are, are coming to us and just saying like, we've got to get on board with this now. So we created this, this is just one minute long, just little celebration of the community of charities um, on Give A Little. comes to the end of our presentation and I hope that you can see from that video that we we're all about charities we're all about helping you raise the funds that you need to do what you do and it makes us feel warm and fuzzy just as it does I'm sure for you when you uh when you get success with your fundraising campaigns 
Um, now, I think we've got some questions in the Q&A. So, Emma, I don't know if you want to... Um... Um, but yeah, we have got some questions. Um, so the first question is, we used to have a mobile donation device in our theatre with another supplier. However, we encountered connection issues as we thought it was going to be powered by 3G, 4G SIM. It ended up needing a connection of its own and clashing with our Wi-Fi connection. Do you know what Payas provides in terms of connectivity to process payments and whether the DIY solution can use the local network or a data SIM? Well, so that we always say this, don't we, Emma? Connectivity is king <laughs> with, with success of cashless. Um, Wi-Fi is the top recommendation if you can. Um, if you can't, um, then um, the devices, whatever device it is, so both the collect-in and the pay-as device will come with a, a, a SIM card which you would need to activate or you can put your own SIM card into that. They are both 4G and as far as I understand you can use your own um, 4G SIM cards. You can also tether to a phone um which is obviously only really a good idea if you're standing with the device um but yeah i think mm -hmm. it, the connectivity side of things you know if you if you have poor connectivity you're just not going to get the donations coming in or you're going to get a failed transaction so um figuring out um you can get um, boosters, Wi-Fi, there's all sorts of things. I know Payas actually do like a sort of MiFi type booster type device. So depending on your building, um, and we work with all kinds of organizations. I know um, like the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust, I know had a lot of challenges because they have very, very old, I didn't think they even have PowerPoints. Um, and I think with Liverpool Cathedral, actually, they used they used power banks because they they didn't have access to the power you know so we we know a lot of you are going to have buildings that have challenges but again you know challenges are there to be solved <laughs> there's, there's usually always a way lovely thank you and then the next question there's two actually that i'm going to kind of bunch together so um do you partner with any crm systems like spectrix tessitura razors edge etc so data can be stored on existing crm modules and then linking that to another question that's come in from Mali, is there a way to export data onto fundraising databases such as Razor's Edge? We use Goodbox and everything is anonymous, so we don't add people's info, but in this case, you'll have more donor info, is that correct? Um, so in terms of CRM integration, um, we don't currently have um, an API where you can just literally plug it into your CRM and it just works. That's because every charity CRM setup is completely different. Um, so on the one hand, we have CSV file downloads, so you can um, download the information, then upload it into your CRM. Um, but we are working with actually both Cancer Research UK and Oxfam on Salesforce CRM integration at the moment, because we both, Emma and I, well, I've worked directly for charities and Emma's worked with charities for, I won't say how many years, but uh, <laughs> a lot of years. <laughs> Um, we know how important CRM is, and it's something we're pushing a lot internally at Give a Little with our tech team. Um, so we're working with them, and um, and it does require really that the charity has, so the, it's, it really works at the moment, I think, more for bigger charities that have their own tech capability, because we are uh, providing, um, I'll get a bit technical here, and I'm, I'm not the technical person, but web hooks and uh, events, so essentially we're pushing information. So if someone makes a donation and then two weeks later, they gift aid that donate donation, then that information is sort of added to their record and then pushed to um, the charity who then will have to kind of enable that to talk to its CRM in the way that, uh, so so essentially, yes, we're really, we really know how important it is. The CSV file upload is, is, is a way of doing it though currently. Um, Thank you. And then another couple um, from Brody from the Science Museum. So are the devices PCI DSS compliant with full end-to-end -end encryption? Do they use data or Wi-Fi? Are there freestanding battery powered options? On the PCI compliant question, so we um, we work with SumUp and Stripe payment processors and they are PCI compliant for what we call semi-attended use. So we're not 
PCR compliant for that kind of um, almost like vending machine situation where you have a device and it's completely unattended. And so obviously we work with a lot of churches or museums or organisations with buildings whereby there is somebody there who if a donor needed to speak to someone, they could. So um, but if you have more detailed questions on that, was it Brody, then perhaps um, drop us an email. If you email, if any of you email hello at givealittle.co, um, Emma and I will see it. Emma, I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add on that. Um, no, there was just the other part about do they use data or Wi-Fi, which I think we covered in a previous yeah. question. And then are there freestanding battery power options? So the collecting, which is the one that can be portable, um, and obviously a an Android device, so a tablet um, alongside a sum up air. They, they do have obviously batteries in, so you could charge up your device, but obviously you would need to keep recharging it. With the collecting, they have a battery that you can take out, charge at home, plug back in, and you can buy extra batteries, um, but you couldn't kind of just leave them, you know, you would have to charge them up. Um, and then there was another part to that, I think. Um, how are they communicated to the charity, the, the information? So you would log into your Give a Little account. So you have the ability to be uh, to add different users to your accounts. So you have admin users and you have volunteers, which is another benefit that we did. There's loads of stuff that we haven't even touched on today. We've kind of given you a very uh, high level overview. Um, if you are added as a volunteer, then it means you can kind of log into the device and you can take that out and about and you can see how much has been raised in, in a particular day but you don't see any of the data behind the scenes to do that you would have to log into your give a little account with a particular email address and password that you've created um, and there you would be able to see all of the information so the reports that Vicky mentioned the gift aid um, information but yeah you would have to log in securely to get that um, and you can log into that whenever and, and wherever um, so if I just get back to the questions again, um, Sophie Stevens, so I, I did see this one in the chat as well, Sophie, but I can see you've moved it. Um, we've introduced two contactless donation stations in our welcome centre, entry and exit, the main entrance to our house and gardens. We have only had a handful of donations on each since the end of April. They have clear signage, six images, oh, that's just moved for me. Um, six images that change to attract the eye and a couple of campaigns with three different possible amounts to select to donate. Do you have any immediate advice on what we could change to attract more use? Um, I'll, I'll go on this one, Vicky. Um, so it sounds like you're doing a really great job. You've obviously doing lots of things that we suggest. Um, the only thing I would add, which is going to sound probably very silly and simple and logical, is talk to people about it. So if you have volunteers that are wandering around that are potentially talking about the gardens, talking about the, the venue, get them to drop that into the conversation as well. Make sure all of your volunteers and staff are on board with it and understand what it is. Get them to use it and see how easy it is. And also if you have any um, ways of talking to your supporters in terms of a newsletter or a blog or information or anything at all on your website put put it on there as well so again it's kind of going back to reassuring people of what it is and what you're doing and it's a news piece you know if you if you suddenly start not suddenly but if you start using contactless devices or qr codes it's a news piece that you can share with your supporters you know, we've installed these devices please come along and make donations and harping back to that charity list type aspect as well um a lot of technically charities people don't understand that they are a charity and I think in the situation of a museum or a cathedral people don't necessarily understand why they're a charity and what the, the money that they give actually achieves so I think it's really important to just go back to absolute basics and make sure you're communicating that to everybody as well you know yes we are a museum and yes potentially maybe you do charge an entrance fee but actually in order to continue doing a b c and d we do rely on volunteers making donations and the volunteers donors and um, so yeah take it back to absolute basics and talk about it put it in in social media and kind of try and highlight it I think um Emma if you remember we were talking to St Albans Museum Trust yesterday um and they've had a lot of success they're doing really well so we wanted to know what they're doing um and they actually have uh so they they have temporary pop-up exhibitions so i guess they do get uh, a different type of visitor for those 
Um, and I think during those, they what they have said, and we do know this, that if you have a person with the device who's talking, with it, people will give more. So I think my advice would be to try that in some way. So either like with the Guildhall Art Gallery, is there a tour? Is there some place where you can prompt a donation where someone knowledgeable can explain again, like why you need the donations? I think it, it is an example of that situation where maybe there's a point of donation in the corner People just walk, so even if you've done all the right sort of thing with the signage and so on, um, you know, people are just walking past it and not and not interacting with it. So that's what that's what I would advise on that as well. And also ask people um, if you see people, are, if you have the, you know, the luxury of having volunteers and people there and they see people kind of looking at it and walking away in a nice way, ask them, you know, can I ask, you know, how you found the experience today? Have you did you enjoy using the machine or the device rather? ask people so you know again a news piece and say um or pick a, a kind of what's the word a working group of people and ask them for advice on how you can improve things potentially of, of kind of valued supporters and ask them for their advice uh, and actually maybe consider where if you have an area where people tend to spend more time actually so you know we've talked about other charities use entrance and exit but is there somewhere where people for example will spend time looking at an exhibition or, or something so maybe consider moving it entirely um, is there a transaction limit or is it in line with contactless, i.e. £200? That's from Dominique. So um, when you have a device that allows chip and pin, uh, then, you know, possibilities are endless for uh, being generous uh, donors. Uh, digital wallet, again, that doesn't have your contactless limit on there. So there are some, there are some devices out on the market that don't allow chip and pin. So if you're tapping, there will be the contactless limit, but if you're paying with a digital wallet, there isn't. Um, so yeah, there's we, we've we seen some very high uh, donation um, transactions go through for like those high value net worth um, individual events um, like Cancer Research UK have, so yeah. Yeah, and I spoke to a charity recently, a really, really tiny charity um, who take people out on, um, wheelchair adapted sailing boats and they had a thousand pound donation from like a complete stranger who'd gone out on the boat so you know if that if that was just a collection bucket for example or a collection tin they wouldn't have put a thousand pounds in so that was a really lovely story and um, back to the question so there's one here from Jenny um, out of everything you've mentioned what would you say is the single biggest factor that makes the most difference to maximize revenue well that's a, <laughs> a open question yeah, I don't know. For for me, it really does revolve around the storytelling, um, storytelling and passionate, engaged individual within the charity. Having a charity champion for cashless again—that's something I've I've seen make such a difference. You know, there's often a lot of there's a lot of um, fear. There's a lot of kind of oh no, this isn't for us. We're not ready for this. If you have someone passionate. In, within the charity is pushing it it will be a success um but yeah the story the story led side of things is so important getting across that cause led messaging making making the you know making the cashless donation experience exactly the same as any of your other fundraising donation led experiences not it not just being a transaction um people want to feel good about donating don't they Mm. and then there's two here that I'm going to put together again so what advantages uh, this is from Sam what advantages does give a little have over good box or liberty pay and then adding that to an anonymous um, one which is we currently use liberty pay and bought three contactless devices they are so expensive yeah. is it possible to switch and use another payment for provider like give a little but keep the same devices so I think just picking that first question what what, how are we different? I really am passionate about the fact that we're mission led. It's the one thing that, you know, I've been at Give a Little for 18 months and Emma's much, much newer. Um, but we're so focused on trying to give all charities, regardless of how big or small they are, we don't tie you into a monthly um we don't tie you into a contract, rather. It's it's seven pounds, starts at seven pounds fifty a month. It's about uh, how much fundraising you're bringing in through Give a Little, depending on how much um, Give a Little, uh, what you pay for the subscription, um, the platform rather. So we, 
we're just very yeah passionate about helping charities but it's it's really what is at the core of what we do and I know that we're we're nearly at 1 p.m so we probably need to wrap this up but Emma I don't know if you want to just quickly say having being new to give a little um yes yeah, as Becky said it's the it's the mission-led approach that the fact that our goal our, our literal goal is to reduce the cost of crashless fundraising so um you know we don't we, we charge a monthly subscription based on how much the charity puts through give a little and for the really small charities that that raise up to a thousand pounds a year it's a free service and as we said it's the larger charities paying that monthly subscription that kind of subsidizes that and helps that happen um and i know that ben our ceo is you know as as we are it's, it's all about reducing that cost and ideally the dream situation is that we grow so much that we, we rely on scale so the scale is so big that we can actually reduce those costs even further um and that's just it's lovely that everything we do the charities are considered the, the number one priority everything we do um i will just do this last question because there's literally one left if that's okay and i feel like it's a nice neat ending then and it's um from kelly um, it may be a silly question, but how does a contactless donation give you the customer's contact details? You mentioned an advantage is obtaining customer data. Um, so that is when someone makes a donation, they're given options that you can set per campaign as a charity. So you have the option to, as Vicky mentioned, put the gift day declaration on there or gift day later. And you also have the option for marketing opt-in. So if someone says yes to opt-in, then obviously you get their data. If they don't, then it is all very anonymous it's just kind of a reference of a card holder um but yeah you have the option for marketing opt-ins which gives you that information going forward so that's all the questions yeah and i would just encourage anyone whose question wasn't answered anyone who just wants to kind of uh talk to us about the challenges we we love meeting charities so please do contact us at hello at givealittle.co with any questions you have um and yeah we'll be really um happy to to meet with you on a one-to-one -one basis if, yeah. if you like you've, you've probably noticed we like to talk um and a talk introing to give a little quite often goes into this whole kind of strategy and have you tried this and what are your plans and it becomes quite a big a big call and um, in terms of the devices you would buy them with our device partners and that's a one-off fee so you're literally buying a device oh then the other one's come in with just sorry i'm going on but liberty pay device is it compatible with Give a Little? I think that's one. If you could drop us an email uh, over, we can um, we can have a chat with with you about that. Definitely. And then is Rosario coming back? Yes. yes. Great. Thank you very much, Vicky and Emma, for our really insightful session on the very very many benefits of cashless giving. This session was part of the Race Program, and we're very grateful uh, to the Arts Council England that funds the program and to the cultural sector network that supports the program as the liberal partners alongside with young arts fundraisers. Thank you and I hope you have a lovely afternoon.